Welcome back to Following Know It On, a Stormlight podcast. This week is episode 16, and we'll be going through chapters 53 through 56 of The Way of Kings. We have some interesting chapters uh, this week with some interesting character, well, one interesting character reveal that I'm ex- excited to to talk about. Uh, Elliot, what are your two words for this this episode? My two words for this set of chapters are innocence and allies. Innocence and allies. Okay. Uh, Paul, what are your two words? For me, I had secrecy and reckless. Secrecy and reckless. Okay. Let's let's discuss these words. All right, Paul, who is Reckless? So there's definitely some reckless behavior in the last chapter that we're going to look into with Dalinar. Uh, He sees that Sadius is in trouble, and he just fully charges in, and it almost costs. uh, They almost lose the fight and uh, almost have some some serious casualties. Okay. Um, But it was a very reckless thing for him to do. Okay. Uh, what was the other word? And with secrecy, it kind of plays into a lot of things. It's not one major moment, uh, but we have some kind of secret, you know, behind the scenes stuff going on. We will talk briefly about Teft, who who may be keeping a secret from Kaladin, okay. as well as the, I guess you could consider it secrecy and recklessness. I will look at the bridge cruise attempts to to get gems out of the chasms. Um, that's a very bold move, but also they're trying to keep it a secret, you know? So uh, those would be some of the main reasons. Okay. Uh, Elliot, talk to me about your two words. So my two words were kind of bookends for, for this episode. Innocence had mostly to do with poor Dunny, poor Bridgman Dunny, who we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit here. But I noted... And the uh, the narrator notes as well that with the loss of Dunny from the the bridge crew, they they lose an, a voice of innocence. Dunny was one of the more innocent, if you will, less less callous, less cynical than a lot of the other bridge men. And so I think there's there's a bit of that outlook on life that they're gonna they're gonna miss from that from the bridge crew. And then allies for. The various chapters we get on on Dalinar with him trying to maneuver his way through the political drama and figure out who his allies are and who they aren't. He ends up allying with Sadius, and then we get a pretty epic moment at the end where Dalinar talks about how you you don't leave an ally stranded on their own. Yeah, and Paul, you define that as reckless, but. I will uh I will have a counter argument for you when we get there. So uh okay, okay. let's let's talk about let, let's ex- explain and talk about Dunny a little bit because Dunny is is he's supposed to be your your endearment um innocent young bridge boy um who who dies and you're supposed to be oh that's really sad. But um he doesn't get that much dialogue, so it's not like a cr- a cry over type of death, but it's it's still sad. The it, the saddest part for me, I think, in all of it was that it wasn't like he just went down to arrows from the the Parshendi army. It wasn't just that he was a, a casualty of war. No, he, the, the main reason why he died is he got shot by his own archers. It was an Alethi arrow. They brought him down, and then the trampling of the the charging horses that that finished him off, and that just makes it worse for me that he he didn't he didn't fall supporting the army. He got he fell because the army he was trying to support didn't care enough about him to to bother not shooting him in the back. 
it's honestly so sad <laughs> like like when i didn't think about it like that but it's like it can't be that hard just don't shoot your your ally right right <laughs> Like, literally, all you had to do is not shoot him, and you'd be fine. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's it's honestly, like Trevor mentioned, it's it's like a sad moment, but uh, Donnie wasn't a super major character, but he definitely was, like, the the most happy-go-lucky of the Bridgemen. Um, there, there are characters like Caliban and Rock and Teft who are trying to help the bridge crew, um, but Donnie was the one who felt more optimistic about things and that um you know things were going to be all right and he could kind of enjoy his time right um so i'm honestly really sad that he's gone because he really was a little a little light in the the bridge crew for sure i just thought of something and i could be reading into this way too much this i feel like this is a typical like english class like looking too deep into an answer <laughs> but he's his name is dunny right he he goes by dunny at least um and so we we have recently learned that kaladin is a surge binder and we know about infused spheres and dun spheres and i don't know whole i don't know fully where i'm going with this but i'm gonna i'm gonna make a super bold semi joke prediction prediction um that this is foreshadowing or some so, some in some way a play on words with with dun and dunny okay <laughs> and again not 100% sure where I'm going with that but it's important um i i actually like where you're going with it just mainly because i like crazy conspiracy theory predictions but i'm struggling to figure out how that would tie in maybe yeah it's it's not that important it kind of popped into my head and it was one of those things i began rolling with and uh... i thought you were gonna make some terrible joke about his life being dunny now and i was like <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh, not exactly not exactly my thought was that I think he, you know, maybe there'll be that symbolism that his his energy was like absorbed into the group, kind of like his positive oh, okay. energy. All right. And so now he's like a dun sphere. <laughs> <laughs> his his light was infused into the group. So maybe that's a pretty way of thinking about it, or maybe that's just a dumb little thing. But oh, I like that actually. Yeah. There we are. Cool. All right. Um, so there's a there's a scene as Dunny is dying, and Kaladin is of course instinctively going to go help him as he should, but Moash holds him back because Moash sees the scenario as Kaladin is just going to get trampled as well. There's Kaladin is going to die if he tries to go help him, and Cal and Moash pins Kaladin to the ground with a move that Kaladin taught him himself. Um, which I thought was very interesting that Moash is certainly, Moash is good enough to the point where he can take, take Kaladin. Maybe he wasn't expecting it, but he can, he can go face to face with Kaladin and take him on and pin him to the ground. Even when he's trying desperately to save someone else. Moash has a few moments spread across these these chapters where he either stands up for Kaladin, saves his life, or is like proud of Kaladin or, or something like that. And he he's definitely come around. He's come he's come completely around from being the against Kaladin to being fully behind him, even to the point where he's ready to save his life, like he does in this chapter. He's kind of, kind of sliding into that unsung hero spot of of the group i guess that yeah he has his moments but honestly i've never given him a second thought i honestly never really thought of that until now i'll be completely honest with with the loss of dunny we're kind of down to six maybe seven core bridgemen left we have kaladin rock 
Teft, Moash, Sigzil, and Lopin. And the seventh could be Shen, if you want to argue Shen. Um, but we've lost Dunny, and Dunny was like one of the only other ones that had dialogue. So uh, we have we have six basically main bridgemen that we're following. Um, in chapter fifty three, when Kaladin is binding, uh, Kaladin decides to. He's kind of distraught with grief from Dunny's death, and he starts healing members of Bridge 8. And all of these members of Bridge 4 who are loyal to Kaladin are trying to be the voice of reason to him as he's binding this guy's leg of Kaladin, we don't have the funds for this. I, I understand that you want to help, but we can't afford it. We don't have the money for even our own bridgemen. And so all of the bridgemen are trying to discourage him from helping the other bridge crews that the other bridge crews treat didn't treat us well and we don't have the funds for this that they're all coming up with excuses as to not not help and kaladin kind of snaps and says this storm you kaladin said standing and sweeping his hand over the plateau the bodies of bridgemen lay scattered ignored look at that who cares for them not sadius not their fellow bridgemen I doubt even the heralds themselves spare a thought for these. I won't stand there and watch while men die behind me. We have to be better than that. We can't look away like the light eyes, pretending we don't see. This man is one of us, just like Dunny was. That, that's a turning point immediately for Teft and Moash as you, like, before the chapter even ends. Moash comes up at, at the end of the chapter to kind of apologize to Kaladin about, you know, holding him back from going to help Dunny. And Kaladin says, no, you did what you needed to do. I, I understand. And uh, Moash apologizes again to him that says, you're not who I thought you were. You You are genuine. That little speech that he has wins over Teft, who gets watery-eyed and... Uh, Elliot, you maybe you you can take this from here, but uh, Moash and Teft specifically gain a lot of respect for Kaladin with this little speech here. Yeah, I think this speech is really a cool moment for Kaladin. We we've seen a couple examples that are that are similar to this, where Kaladin is, I think we've said before, he's a very all in kind of a person. Even though he managed to save all of the the men the Bridgman and his crew, with the exception of Dunny, there, there's no one injured in his crew that he needs to help. He still has to go out and search for these these other Bridgman that are that are hurt and try to save them. He always has to do something. But that does lead to a moment which you're referring to, which I, I highlighted and I noted because it confused me a little bit. I don't know if this is a hint at something else or or where this is going, but Kaladin is trying to trying to save the other Bridgman. He's trying to figure out, okay, how do we get them back? How are we going to take care of them? And then he and Teft have this uh, this little exchange here. And it, it goes like this. I'll read it. Teft was silent, and Kaladin steered, steeled himself for in incredulity. Instead, however, the grizzled soldier smiled. He actually seemed a little watery-eyed. Kellick's breath, it's true. I never thought. And it just, you know, tails off into, into nothing after that. And I kind of highlighted that as... as Where's he going with that? Why? What does he think he sees looking at Kaladin, or or what does he think is true about Kaladin? We know that he's been. We know that Tef knows that he's a surge binder, and that Kaladin Kaladin hasn't realized he's a surge binder yet. So Tef is kind of hinting at at that in in not so so subtle ways in other sections. But this seems like like it might be something different. I didn't really know what this was what this was hinting at here. So, I don't remember the name of the the order, I guess, that Teft was a part of before the bridge cruise. He's referenced it before. I don't remember the name of it. But they studied the Knights Radiant and studied their, their surge binding abilities. And I guess what Teft is saying here is 
he knows that Kaladin can surge bind, but he wants to believe in Kaladin as a person. And this this speech that Kaladin is saying really from from his heart, and Teft gets a little watery eyed because he realizes that it's true that he really does care for these bridgemen, and he's, it's not just an act. He's he's willing to save all of these men from Bridge Eight, and he doesn't know what he's going to do, but it it doesn't matter because he needs to save them immediately. He doesn't have time to think about logistics. He's going to save them because it's right. Okay. Yeah. There's more to that speech, which I'm kind of sad that I didn't realize. I, I, want to, I want to read the rest of it. This man is one of us, just like Dunny was. The light eyes talk about honor. They spout empty claims about their nobility. Well, I've only known one man in my life who was a true man of honor. He was a surgeon who, helped, who would help anyone, even those who hated him, especially those who hated him. Well... We're going to show Gaz and Sadius and Hashal and any other sodden fool who cares to watch what he taught me. Now go to work and stop complaining. It really shows the impact that Liren had on Kaladin going forward. That Liren was willing to save uh, Rashon, even though Rashon ruined their life later that he Liren would have still saved Rashon, and that's that's really put an imprint on Kaladin and how he lives his life I did think that was cool him referencing his his father there because we we kind of left flashback Kaladin in a point where we're not really sure what his relationship with his father is at does he admire him does he despise him he had just learned essentially that Liren did steal the the spheres from Rashon, and so we're not really sure if Kaladin still admires his father, but this right here shows that he clearly does, that he clearly does admire his father and that he is his inspiration to to do what he does, to try and save everyone that he can. I think there is a huge uh, point about that in, in that... Uh, from all the flashback Kaladin chapters we had, you're right. There, it, it was always it felt like it was always flopping back and forth between Kaladin has this uh, really high respect for his father and this almost not distrust, but non agreement with with the the qualities that that Liren lived by um, and the things that he did. Um, and here, I th I think we see that. Kaladin really did have the utmost respect and impact from his father based off of his action. Uh, we know that Liren would have saved anyone. E even we talked about, uh, Trevor mentioned the the people who who fought against him and, and didn't like him. You know, he would still even save them. Um, and here we see Kaladin not in the same way of like a life-saving surgery necessarily, but his willingness to, you know, put others' lives before his own and no matter who it was, um, being concerned for Bridgman, even of another bridge crew, not even his. And so I think with that action, we're able to see his respect for his father in that. Um, so I think that's a really important scene, obvious, honestly. Yeah, totally. Before we completely move on from Chapter 53... Um, there's a big, long, big, long quote from Teft, and I won't read the whole thing, but Teft is kind of prying at Kaladin, uh, um, asking if he still has spheres, if he has stormlight on him, and he chides him for, or he tells him to never spend the spheres, that it's lucky, and Kaladin kind of stops what he's doing and looks at him, because he's being really weird, and Kaladin looked up. I'll just read it. Kaladin looked up again, frowning. What are you saying, Teft? Nothing. Get back to that sewing. How many times do I have to tell you? Kaladin raised an eyebrow, but turned back to his work. I I just love the the completely the, 
Teft is completely unsubtle about his his prodding here. He's trying to be subtle, but he's not doing a very good job. He's just trying to casually casually ask Kaladin, "Hey, do you do you have spheres on you?" that that type of thing. And Teft and Kaladin's like, "What are you talking about?" And Teft's like, "Nothing. Nothing. Get back to work." It's it's he's so bad at it. It's really funny to me. Honestly, this was this was I mean, not the only reason, but I chose secrecy and it's that uh, as one of my words, and that's partly because we, the reader, know Kaladin is a surge binder, and we know that Teft is really like, the only one who knows that. And uh, I, I can honestly see this really well adapting into a movie or show scenario. And this is that moment where you, you're like, just tell him, like, just please say something like, this is killing me almost. And, and I feel like that was that moment. It's this awkward moment that's not casual uh but they're like what what's going on um and and i honestly can't wait for for kaladin to find out he's a search binder uh, i don't know when that will be i'm hoping sometime this book i imagine it has to be right it is well, it is very very soon the next chapter we will read next week my favorite scene in the entire book and it has to do with that oh shoot I was just going to say there's a little hint of of something like that in chapter 55 where Kaladin is starting to notice that something is up. He He's starting to notice that he heals quickly and that something supernatural is going on, but he still doesn't know what. So I was wondering if that was hinting at the answers, maybe not the answers, but him, all of that coming to a head here soon. So we'll have to keep on reading, I suppose. Yeah, in, in 55... Doesn't he get a cut on his cheek at the yeah. beginning of the battle? And then by the time the end of the battle, it's already healed. Yep, and he's really exactly. confused about it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. True. So I'm very, uh, it's making pretty deliberate points at that. So I'm super excited for that to be resolved. Um, I completely understand why Taft isn't outright saying it. Because as far as I understand, um, surge binders aren't the most popular people, I guess. You know, there's a lot of. A lot of stuff with them, you know, um, especially with some of the characters like Dalinar uh, probably aren't the biggest fan of, fans of Surge Binding and, and stuff. Um, well, and there is a certain Surge Binder going around murdering all of the most important people of the world, so... That's... That, you know, I'm sure that will affect <laughs> things as well. Uh, so. And the chapter right before we... We learned that the Day of Recreance did indeed happen. We don't know why it happened, but we learned that the Radiants did indeed abandon their shards. Yep. True. All right. Um, Chapter 54. Chapter 54 is very interesting from a... if If you're reading the way of kings for the first time but you've also read other cosmere books for the first time you know who hoyd is hoyd is a known outside stormlight archive character from mistborn from warbreaker from elantris and so back in interlude one when ishik is told to go find hoyd that's supposed to be your cosmere readers like kind of the Brandon Sanderson throwing throwing them a bone of, yeah, Hoyt's here. We just haven't found him yet. 54 is we found Hoyt. Hoyt is the king's wit. And he's been here the whole time in and amongst the light eyes trying to find out what's what's going on. I am really curious about this. So you mentioned that with the wit. And I felt like it, it, this chapter did a good job of setting that up uh, Dalinar is like hmm where's wit and he's like well he's not where he normally would be kind of poking and prodding at people as they uh, enter the 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 feast and so he's like well he's probably just switching it up and I feel like that's a pretty big hint to the reader that mm, something's going on here you know that winds are changing <laughs> yeah that something something's up we don't we don't fully understand wit um, and so Trevor mentioned Hoyd, and I don't fully understand who that is. 
in in all honesty, whenever I was uh, listening to this chapter, I do remember Hoyd, and I remember that with Ishik, so I'm extremely curious about that. Finally, I feel like this is the first semblance of an interlude character, someone who is just introduced in an interlude, kind of being tied into who we know. Mm-hmm. So I'm extremely excited about that. <laughs> outstanding moment um but i honestly whenever he said you can call me hoid or whatever wit Wit says something like that i thought that was a joke i I didn't think wit was actually hoid i thought that was like oh people know who hoid is maybe and haha i'm hoid as almost a joke i actually didn't take that very literally people do not know who hoid is so he's he is introducing himself as hoid Okay, okay. Interesting. Um my my one little nugget from this section that I thought hints at there's something a lot more to this character was actually when Wit slash Hoyd kind of makes his exit. He he basically says, I'm out, Dalinar, see you later, the Cosmere needs me. And I read that like wait a second. Not Roshar needs me, not another place needs me, the Cosmere needs me, which even as a first-time reader with a little bit of of exposure to this, I know that the Cosmere is the universe, not the, you know, specific place that they're at. And so when I read that, I'm like, wait a second, where are you going off to that the Cosmere needs you? Right. Okay, there's a lot more to this character than we think. Maybe I'm reading too much into that, but the wor- the n- little bit of information you just gave us, Trevor, I think tells me I'm not. That kind of led me towards the realm of this guy's way more than we, we have seen so far. That's what I honestly like about his character. It, it's, it's, it's entertaining because he's like, ah, ha, ha, I'm Hoyd. Oh, you know, the Cosmere needs me. And it's all all feels like a joke and not serious, but he from the pieces of information we have elsewhere, it's like he is serious and he's right. some major, major influence somehow. And I think that's really interesting. Um Yeah, it definitely it definitely is. It it's one of those cases where he he's joking but not at the same time. He's I, coming off as, as silly, like he's goofing around, but then you, you laugh a little bit and then you're like, oh wait, he's serious. <laughs> I I I have a, a very vivid movie moment stuck in my head from another movie from Lord of the Rings when Sam is accusing Smeagol of sneaking and he's like, so what were you doing? And he's like, sneaking. <laughs> As a joke. But it's true. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. It's, so it's so interesting that like that interaction and it's a very wit thing and and so I think that's um I think that's really honestly I am very interested in Hoyd now. Especially knowing that Wit actually is Hoyd. That makes it seem super weird to me how the Wit who's up there with all the lies and the king and Ishik, who we don't we don't know that much about him, but he's, he seems like a super you know tiny villager fisherman. I, I don't know. I don't know how those are going to tie together. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm super curious. Do we have to go off and read Mistborn now? <laughs> um, you Hoyd actually isn't really in Mistborn. He's mentioned in Mistborn, but he's not really a character. Uh, Warbreaker is what you actually would need to read. Got it. Okay. We'll just take a quick pit stop and for next week. So there's something that Hoyd, Wit, whatever we want to call him, says that I, I thought was really interesting. And Trevor, you actually mentioned it, alluded to it already. He kind of opens up this conversation with Downer by saying, the winds are changing. And this ties in with some other foreboding ominous kind of stuff we've seen before in Dalinar's visions he's been told that the Everstorm is is coming in in Kaladin's dream he's been told that Odium is coming 
now we're being told that the winds are changing. He even said, I think he goes on to say some, some even more like ominous things. And so it seems like a lot of things are pointing to something big is coming. But the wording of this one was very specific and interesting. And when he says the winds are changing, I immediately thought of Kaladin because Kaladin has always had this kind of affinity for wind. He's got still his little wind sprand, and he's always described as this wind about him. And so when he says winds are changing, I immediately thought that you could almost take that literally to mean Kaladin is changing. This could be a very direct reference to not just change is coming, not just something big is coming, Kaladin is coming. So I thought that was interesting. I actually haven't didn't think about it that way, but yeah, that's that's pretty cool. You can always leave it to Elliot to point out those like really cool connections. I could be barking up the wrong tree with that one, but I saw wind. I thought Kaladin. I know Kaladin's reaching a, a point where he's about to discover something, so we'll see what happens. Yep. All right, pushing past Hoyd. Um, let's get to the actual feast and Sadius or Dalinar's confrontation of Sadius. Um, Dalinar is prepared for a fight. He's he's setting up guards to make sure he has a safe exit if Sadius declares him to be a, trying to assassinate the king. And Adolin has made sure that the king's guards are some of the ones most loyal to Dalinar so that they probably wouldn't arrest him um, anyway. And D uh, Adolin doesn't want to even want to be there. When Dalinar tells Adolin that Sadius is planning something, Adolin's like, okay, time to go. We're going to go back to our war camp and fortify. Um, Dalinar said, no, we're going we're gonna to see what, he's, what he has to say. And Dalinar walks right up to Sadius and asks him in front of a bunch of other people, like, hey, what, what's your status on the, on the investigation? And Sadius declares him innocent, basically. He, he sets up all this, uh, how he got there, but he basically says that Dalinar is most likely innocent, but somebody did try to kill a king. I, I came out of that whole reveal starting to maybe question my my mental image of Sadius a little bit, which is what Dalinar is doing too. Dalinar and Aelin are, are now checking themselves of, you know, oh, we just assumed Sadius was going to throw us under the bus, and then he didn't. I'm starting to think back about what we know about Sadius, and we, we know that he's he's fairly arrogant. He's very he's he's rather selfish. He he fights from the back of his army instead of the front, like like Dalinar does. He's he's a bit manipulating. He's he's a little bit spiteful, but I think so far he's proven to be pretty honest. I don't know that we've seen an example yet where Sadius has has actually gone and done something dishonest, and so. Maybe this shouldn't have come as as big of a surprise as it did. I mean, Sadius maybe not be may not be the most upstanding moral character, but at the same time, maybe this isn't so much of a stretch for him to to do the honest path. And Sadius even kind of says that himself of, you know, do you really know me, Dalinar, if you just assumed I was gonna take the the dishonest route? So I'm I'm re questioning my thoughts on Sadius as well. Paul, any thoughts? So I thought this was really interesting and it, it kind of sets it up as there's going to be this huge conflict and we see that Delanor was kind of surprised by by Sadius is almost being on his side um, and, and I thought that was that was pretty interesting and honestly cool because um I lost my train of thought one sec. They get to ally now. So yes. that's cool. I thought that was really cool because, yeah, now we have Dalinar and Sadius who, I guess, historically in the past were like good good buddies and, and teammates almost and allies. And now they're almost rejoining, even though they've they kind of split off for a long time and had very distinct differences. Right. Um, ways they wanted to do things. And we're kind of seeing them come together and they ultimately form an alliance, which I was actually super excited for uh, because I know Dalinar 
had tried to make alliances with other people and it was always these like kind of no name like the other people we don't really care about right right um but now it's with sadius and sadius is a cool big big character and and stuff and not just because he's a a notable character but um it seems like they have kind of complementary strengths and everything so so I, I was super excited for that um, I feel like it's a good kickstart and and will really help. Something it's kind of, it's kind of the first time in in this story with Dalinar that we've seen his like negotiation really work out. I feel like every time he kind of just gets beaten down on this, <laughs> oh, we can't work with you, we can't work with you, we don't want to, we don't want to, and, yep. and it seems like it'll actually work out for him. Something I want to highlight is the final motivation that Sadius needed to actually ally with Dalinar. And it wasn't the fight with the Parshendi, but it was the thought of getting his own shard blade. Dalinar bait kind of like baits him with that idea of if we win if we kill a shard bearer, I'll get the plate, but you can get the blade. And Sadius has plate, but he need he wants a blade. So that's that's something very important to to Sadius to get a to get a shard blade. So Dalinar does finally convince Sadius to work with him, and we've talked before about their two very different styles of of war. Their two different codes of honor, if you will, or, or lack thereof, on on Sadius' side. But moving into chapter 55, we get to see this firsthand where Kaladin and the Bridgman get to watch the the battle happen with Sadis getting there first and then Dalinar arriving where what they originally think is, oh, look, he's too late to the party. He's going to have to turn around. Oh, wait, no, they're actually engaging. They're fighting. This was planned. And so we get to see that where... Again, Dalinar and Adolin leap across the chasm, which I still think is an epic way to start the battle and, and start clearing the Parshendi out and then the bridges rolling behind and then you the the battle commences. And I, I think that battle they win, right? They win yep. pretty easily. It looks like so, Sadius is going to lose and then Dalinar right. shows up, right? Yep, yep. And then the battle goes so well and they go get back so so quickly that they're sent into the chasms that very day. And that's this is where, Paul, you were talking about this a little bit earlier in the episode, that we get to learn more about Parshendi, and Shen um, has an interesting reaction to the Parshendi. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to. So we see that Shen... So, so Shen is the, the bridge crew member who's a Parshman, which is really interesting, and... Oh, as far as we know, it's like a joint, like maybe this will sabotage the bridge or maybe this will be a great breakthrough and we could use Parchman as Bridgman. And it's it's interesting. Uh, but so when they're in the the chasms on, on their, their, their chasm duty stuff, we learn that Shen has been a good like bridge crew member. He hasn't tried to sabotage a bridge run or anything like that, but when they're there with the, whenever they're in the chasms where there's a bunch of dead, like, parchment bodies, Shin is extremely protective over those, and and wants them to be, like, respected and cared for carefully. And it causes, like, a lot of, like, unrest within the bridge crew. Right. They, they it shows that they, like, try to restrain him, and he, he's all, like, upset and, like, wanting to to care for the the dead body like the dead parchman um which uh, as far as we know um that's kind of like the one thing that he can do as a parchman still um, is care for the the other deceased parchman um and so he he seems very passionate about it um but it it, it almost feels a little unsettling in a way, and definitely the bridge crew members are unsettled by it almost. Um, so I don't know what to fully make of it, but but we see that he has a, like a distinct care for them, but 
not to a point that he'd even like bother upsetting a bridge run. It's kind of interesting. Right. And Elliot, you have in the outline, Kaladin plans to somehow use this reaction. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so when that does happen, there's a moment where Kaladin thinks to himself, oh, I can use this, but it'll be really dangerous, or something like that. Of He's, he's worried what the effects are going to be of using it, but I can't think of how he w- how he plans to use this, how he plans to use Shen's reaction to the dead Parshendi to his advantage. So I'm trying to figure this out of, of what his plan is because we don't get really anything, any more details beyond that. So I'm curious to see what he thinks he's going to try. I know, but I can't... Uh, well, of course. I can't tell you. <laughs> wow. Really, you're gonna just be like, "Oh, I know," and then, <laughs> yeah, that's kind of rub our faces in it. Ragadocious. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I well, did note. I did note that this was was of particular interest, though, because we've seen recently several examples of kind of pointing out where parchment are different than parshendi, where there are clear differences of these are not quite the same. But in the past, we saw that parshendi get enraged when you move their dead. There's even a scene in one of the battles where Dalinar is like, I think I think it's Dalinar is mm-hmm. is like kicking the dead bodies of the Parshendi to to make the the Parshendi mad. I would I would not have expected that same like connection to their dead to extend to the Parshman. I figured that would be something that was unique to the Parshendi, but then now we see this with Shen that it's that's something they seem to share is that this concern for their dead or whatever custom that they're used to of the the dead shouldn't be touched or something like that. So this was an example that kind of ties them closer together to say that the Parshmen are similar to the Parshendi in this, this manner, which was, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, for sure. We, uh, Paul, was it this episode or last episode that you had secret or secrecy? As one of your That's words, this one. yeah, secrecy is one of my words, and it's it's also large part with with the bridge crew in the in the chasm here. Um, Rock has a few secrets that we get to uh, get yeah. to explore. Yeah, no joke. Um, so so part of it is uh, the some of the bridge crew members are enamored that they find an emerald brome here. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is just more money than than some of them can even fathom. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> a lot of the their thoughts are consumed with how can we get this out of here? Uh, and they know that, that you know, Kaladin's kind of the wake up call. I think it was Kaladin at least that we we can't even even if we did take it out, a- any bridgeman with an emerald from would be like what you, you can't there's no way you have that you know like that that's what'd you do right um and stuff and so so they don't try to take that but they do find this kind of sneaky way or secret way to to try and get gemstones out of there so that they can buy more resources and um you know help their crew and other crews and so they try to put gemstones in a bag and shoot an arrow under the bridge that they would then get on a bridge run. If, if I understood that right onto one of the permanent bridges. Right. Um, and so was it Teft that they asked and they were originally like, yeah, can you like shoot this up, you know, this bag up there? And he was like, yeah, sure. I mean, you just, was it him who said it was easy, or maybe Rock was like, "Yeah, that's easy. You literally just pull the string and point it and shoot, right?" So, so Kaladin brings it up, and Teft and Sigzil are talking about it. How they've they've seen people shoot them, but they've never done it to themselves. And Rock has an offhand comment of, "It's really easy. You just pull the pull the string back and shoot." And Teft looks at him and he's like, "I don't think it's that easy." But then it. it... It's funny where it goes too, because Kaladin picks up on, ooh, maybe Rock knows how to do this, and so then he like kind of goes through the motions of, oh, Tef, just you know, give it a try, just give it a shot, you know, see what you can do, and 
knowing that rock is going to have to step in and, and show him how to do it, which he does. And then we don't get an explanation about why rock knows how to shoot a bow. He's been very clear in the past that it's not his place to be a warrior. He's, I, I remember talking about this cause it's, it's a little confusing. He had said that his place was to be like a craftsman, but at the same time, we also know that he's, he's proficient in cooking. So that seems to be his role in the, the group. But clearly, he's made it very clear that he's not a warrior who refuses to fight those kinds of things. But apparently, he knows pretty well how to use a bow and arrow. Correct. I wonder why. Yep. Uh, for the for the horn eaters, the firstborn is the cook, so everyone has food. The secondborn is the craftsman, and everybody else after that is the warrior. So. He's he's not fourth born, is what he says. Um, so he refuses to fight, but he clearly knows how to use a bow. So right. Mm. I thought it was funny that moment where he's like, "No, no, 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 no!" Like you're doing, <laughs> you're doing it wrong. Exactly. Yeah. And he mumbles. He mumbles to himself. It's like this is near nearly an impossible shot, and then just gets it first try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Air sick uh, lowlanders. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was really that that was a cool thing, and also my my other favorite bridge member for sure, um, Sigzil. Uh, we we learn briefly, so so we know that Sigzil is a world singer. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that kind of comes to light a little more in this, and so they're kind of like, you know, tell me a story, and he's like, no, I'm not like a storyteller. I'm a world <laughs> singer. There's a big difference, in right? All this- technicality stuff uh but we learn of yesrian right and, and correct uh, uh yesrian the name of the storm father and i believe it was mentioned that yesrian like had named something that was the the story um i don't remember the specifics so uh, that uh, was really interesting uh sit kaladin asks a sigzil if there's a place in the world on roshar that has a city in the ground basically there's a bunch of deep gouges in the ground and sigzil says oh yeah uh sesamelix dar is what you're talking about and it's really they're really pride they're really proud because they think that yesrian himself created it the storm father and um the reason why is because it's immune to high storms because it's got like it's got protection on the lips and then at at the bottom of the gorges there's drainage um there's natural drainage so it doesn't flood so and the only reason and the only way that would happen is if Yezrian himself created it so they think that Yezrian the storm father created the created the city is it on your map over there Elliot it is on my map. I was just looking at that. It's it's near to Azir. It's a, a neighboring country, it looks like, uh, to Azir, very much at the southern tip of, of Roshar, if you will. I did I did get some answers in this exchange between the characters on, on the name Yezrian, and then there's also like an alternate version of, of that name, Ye- Yezereze, I suppose is how you'd probably say that. We, we've seen both of those names before, actually, and I had kind of assumed that it was the same person, and it, it, this is makes it very clear. Signals, Sigzil says, you know, oh, you call him Yezereza or whatever it is, and we know that this is one of the heralds, and I think he even says in this that he was the king of the, of the heralds is how he says it, but I was surprised to hear him say that this is the Stormfather. I had been kind of assuming... I've been kind of going down more the train of thought of the Stormfather was the Almighty, and that those two were were equivalent. Not that the Stormfather is one of the heralds. So that was a that was an interesting bit for me, and and I realize I know we've talked about the Stormfather and the heralds before. Of the answer you get depends on who you ask, and, correct? You know, what their religious beliefs are. So I'm not taking this as definitive. You know, this is the absolute truth here, but this was a a different version of who the storm father is than the line that i had kind of been going down myself so i i'm not sure what to think now about the storm father 
Yezrian is one of the two characters we meet in the prelude. Yezrian and Kalak are the two heralds that we meet in the uh, the prelude. Right. And Kalak, we see his name, or like a modified version of his name, used in, in different references as Kelek. Right. At least that's the, again, the assumption I'm jumping to that that's the same person, just kind of this modified version of their name, which is, is interesting. But yeah, another one of the heralds we have a name for. Uh, let's see, what else in chapter 55? Is that everything from chapter 55? I think we got it. Most of it, at I least. Remember. Yeah, I think that's everything I have for 55. So let's see what's next. Chapter chapter 56. Oh, we get to the good stuff now. So chapter 56 actually opens with an interesting bit about the Parshendi again. We're learning, we're learning more and more about the Parshendi, which I'm... I've been looking forward to learning more, and we're getting some answers here. Dalinar has this odd moment in the midst of battle where he realizes that the Parshendi, where they fight in pairs, seem to be commonly, if not all the time, one bearded Parshendi and one beardless Parshendi. And he kind of is looking at that like, wait a second, is this a male and a female Parshendi fighting alongside? I think he even thinks maybe these are like married couples that are that are fighting together in, in this manner i thought that it was an interesting bit to 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 think about to learn about the parshendi but it was also odd that dalinar in the midst of battle is is processing through this you would think he'd be very tuned into the you know staying alive but instead he's musing on oh is that a is that a female parshendi or a male parshendi <laughs> it's it's definitely highlighting the fact that Dalinar is, he's not, his mind's not in it. He's there, Distracted. he's yeah. there for his men, but he wants to, he wants to learn more about the Barshendi more than kill them at the moment. No joke. I feel like every single fight scene we've ever seen with Dalinar, it's him fighting like intensely, and then he's like, hmm, let me have this deep thought. <laughs> and- yeah and why I'm here and what I'm doing and everything else in the world and then maybe I'll continue fighting later and that's kind of the case here um, which I think is interesting uh, Delinar's entire character and all the chapters about him seem very focused on his internal struggle um, I feel like he's got to be the the primary character for internal struggle which says a lot there's a lot of internal struggle. You don't with think Kaladin. you don't think Kaladin's the primary character for internal struggle? I, mean, I understand. Yes, I understand that Kaladin has immense internal struggle, but I think Dalinar is more so because, well, simply if we're comparing internal versus external struggle, because Kaladin internally has a lot going on, but I feel like it's largely influenced by the external things going on. Sure. Um, obviously being a bridgeman and being like a prisoner and all that stuff um, is <laughs> that's got to take a toll on your mental state right and it, it's it's a big reason for uh, why he is mentally like where he is um, he has his own struggles sure uh, but I think Dalinar is like very primarily this is his obstacle is this internal struggle there's not that much external struggles, or at least if there are, it's likely stemming from that uh, rather than the other way around. And, and so I, I think it's kind of interesting. And so <laughs> every Dalinar chapter, um, and it's not necessarily like a huge like depressing struggle, but it's always like questioning and confusing and ambiguous, and he doesn't know what's going on. Right. So it's really interesting and and stuff but kind of it's kind of tying into that i have a question for both of you um and it kind of moves on elliot did you have something to say before we moved on i was just going to say that it seems like every time dalinar goes into battle he has an existential crisis he does he's he's questioning who am i what am i every time he's going to the battle 
so humorous. It's been brought up a couple times, and I wanna I wanna get you guys' thoughts on this. Dalinar's nausea that he gets during battle, and the thrill that he reaches to to get rid of the nausea. Can I get can I get your thoughts on this, uh, Paul? I'll start with you. Keep in mind that the thrill is capitalized. CN didn't know that. We've talked but about it before. There, there seems to be a lot of capitalized words that, that normally there are. There are. This book. Yeah. I'll just assume the entire book is capitalized. <laughs> <laughs> the page is just shouting at you. Yes. Exactly. Caps lock. <laughs> um. I honestly don't know what to make of it yet. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's it's Dalinar going in and out of different states of mind. Um, I don't know which is the normal one. This is my question. Like, I don't know if this absolute like monster on the battlefield is his normal state. Like, where I guess you consider the thrill whenever he's fighting and just you know i guess you could refer to it as like the black thorn right like his his warrior stuff that he's known for um and then the the other state where he is like disgusted at the the fighting and grows nauseous i that's definitely not the normal as far as what we know of of dalinar's life right um but it but it's becoming a very like recurrent theme theme Honestly, uh, like like Elliot just mentioned, every single fight he ha- is having an existential crisis. Um, but I honestly don't know what to make of it right now. Elliot? Yeah, I'm not super sure either. We, we have talked about the thrill a little bit before, and I don't think my, my thoughts on it have changed that much. It, it still seems like a, a mix of adrenaline and, and bloodlust and almost like a a trance maybe that he or, or an other state of being that he can you know enter into to become a, a warrior or enjoy the the battle and not feel guilty by it and i think the nausea seems to come on on him when he when he breaks out of that and instead of embracing the thrill he's starting to kind of question is this the right thing to be doing is is it okay that i'm letting myself get completely taken over by the thrill and enjoy all this killing and slaughter and when he starts to think about that that's when the the thrill kind of dies out and the nausea starts to to come you know take over and where he he has to i think it even the chapter even closes with he has to you know run off so his men don't see him hurl because he's he's so disgusted with what he sees around him but yeah yeah i think it's him breaking out of that state of bloodlust or battle lust. I I think I just thought of something. So we talked in the last episode about the old magic and the what is it? You you kind of get like like a gift and a curse almost. Yeah. Yep. I wonder if this could be tied into that. I don't know which is which Ooh. though. I don't know if this bloodlusted state where he can just kill and is a monster on the battlefield is a gift or a curse like you know because that's that's an incredible like gift in the sense of winning the war right that he's an incredible warrior right but this almost like non-remorse like maybe naturally his normal state is he doesn't you know he's not maybe like a natural born killer and, and such but maybe he sought out the old magic and so he was given this incredible like talent um when he goes into that state and he he can just be an incredible warrior um but almost in this like bloodlusted state um, if so, it i don't know if it helps your theory at all not everyone has gone to seek the old magic obviously but adolin and sadius both have said that they feel the thrill as well if that helps your theory I don't know that, that that doesn't throw it out for me though. I, I I like what your where your thoughts are going here, Paul, because 
Dalinar seems to have a unique interaction with the thrill, so that that could be tied into his encounter with the the Night Watcher and the old magic. I could see that being possible. I was gonna say, like with the 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 example with Adel, you said it was Adolin who uh, you know states he enjoys the thrill of battle. I imagine lots of the, especially like Light Eyes and Shard Bears may enjoy that thrill, right? Uh, especially if you're a Shard Bear, I feel like you have kind of an unfair advantage. Um, so it's probably not as in, as scary right. going to battle. Um, but yeah, like I said, I don't know if Dalinar's fighting capability may be a curse or a blessing. Or, or what that could be, uh, but it could be a curse in that he naturally wouldn't want to fight, and he would naturally be on that side of like feeling nauseous when he is killing. Um, and maybe like the other warriors, you know, we know that Dalinar is pretty different from the rest. So, but yeah, that's that's the only kind of prediction I can make off of that. Cool. All right, to close out uh, chapter 56, we have a very cool moment of Dalinar riding to Sadius' aid to save him. So kind of the logistics here. The Sadius arrives first to secure the chrysalis, make sure the Prashendi don't run off with it. Dal Dal Did I say Sadius? Sadius arrives first. Dalinar comes second. To kind of flank the enemy army and make and push at him from the other side so that they'll they'll win like they did the uh the chapter before but this time the parshendi have a second army themselves and they flank sadius after dalinar comes and dalinar sees this and rides gallant his rishadium horse through the parshendi to get to uh to get to sadius to save him Paul, you said that this was reckless. Do you want to do, do you want to explain this? Well, reckless um, is a kind of blanket term that I could apply there a little bit, and also to the 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 previous strategies with the bridgeman. Um, but since he's a shard bear and such a talented warrior, maybe it's not entirely reckless. But he is kind of like running, you know, like sprinting into the enemy lines, right, to, to save his ally, um, which, I mean, that's not safe. <laughs> you right. Know? Um, uh, reckless is a strong word to describe it, but but yeah, sure. He, he, he was, you know, sprinting in there, you know, like no regard for for what else is going on or if, it, if anything else is really going on there. I feel like it could even be equal parts reckless and brave bravery of yeah he's charging to go save Sadius but he has to charge right through the entire Parshendi army to get there and he does so on his own he doesn't even wait for his his guards to to back him up so I think it's definitely an element of of recklessness there of I'm going to charge through these thousands of, of Parshendi all on my own, even though I am a shard bear and he's got a shard blade and shard plate that, that still seems rather dangerous, but I, I definitely left this chapter with a, a sense of awe of what a cool moment for Dalinar to char to drop everything that he's doing, risk his own life to go and save Sadius. And he does save Sadius's life. Sadius had been overwhelmed by the Parshendi. He had fallen. They were about to, to kill him, and Dalinar arrives just in time to to save him, and it's a really really cool moment. At uh, at the end of the chapter, Dalinar and Sadius are talking, and uh, Dalinar explains his reasoning. I'll read a quote here. Sadius frowned. That was a terrible risk, Dalinar. Why? You do not abandon your allies on the battlefield. Not unless there's no recourse. It is one of the codes. Sadius shook his head. That honor of yours is going to get you killed, Dalinar. He seemed bemused. Not that I feel like offering a complaint about it this day. If I should die, Dalinar said, 
then I would do so, having lived my life right. It is not the destination that matters, but how one arrives there. The codes? No. The Way of Kings. That storming book. That storming book saved your life today, Sadius, Dalinar said. I think I'm starting to understand what Gavilar saw in it. That storming book. That's the title of the chapter. I, I love that. Uh... <laughs> And that quote, saw... that quote in the middle there is so good, so good. Like, embroider that on a pillow or something. Yeah. That if I should die, then I would do so having lived my life right. It is not the destination that matters, but how one arrives there. And and clearly that ties into the, the Knight's Radiant motto or code or whatever that we saw before of journey before destination. And we've we talked about that before of how cool that was. And this is just another instance of. You know, when you read that, I just want to shout out like, yes, that exactly. Yep. yep. It's, it's on my, it's on my quote board for my, the, the way of King's quotes. And I, it's, it's definitely a good one. And then you stop reading with that section and, and I thought that was a good place to end it, but where it actually goes in the next paragraph, I think is, is almost equally as important the very next paragraph after where you ended, Sadius basically asks Dalinar or, or says to Dalinar, hey, perhaps we should talk about this sometime. Or, you know, hey, we should you should tell me more about what you what you mean by this. I was completely taken aback by that of like, wow, Sadius has come completely around to looking down on Dalinar for reading this book, mocking him for reading this book, mocking him for following these codes to Dalinar just proved to him that following the codes is an honorable thing. He just saved Sadius's life because he's adhering to these codes. Sadius might just be starting to realize that, oh, maybe there's something to these codes that, you know, I'm not thinking of. That was a big moment. I think Dalinar may have just kind of broken through Sadius's Sadius's wall a little bit. Yeah. He Which did again. Say so what was that paul said he did save his life so right yeah yep. so but yeah no i think that was a really awesome moment and uh i, I hope that kind of like works out I, i'm interested to see if there's any kind of dialogue there in the future between them yeah me too it this plays into also me kind of revising my my view of sadius a little bit i still am, am very much not a fan of his battle tactics. I'm not a fan of how he uses Bridgman. I'm not a fan of the way he treats the other people around him. But I don't know. Maybe is this a start of Sadius maybe having a little bit of a redemption moment? I don't know. I'm curious to see where this is going to go. Yeah. And this next chapter uh, that we're going to read next week, it is not my favorite chapter of the book but it does contain my favorite scene of the book. Oh it, boy. Um, the chapter is the longest chapter in the, in the book. So make sure you've got a, a snack when you go to read it, but <laughs> it's, it's very, it's very good when, when you read it, I'm very excited to talk about it uh, next week with you guys. That'll be so fun. Well, let's wrap this up and go read it then. Sounds yeah. good to me. Um, any closing thoughts, uh, gentlemen? None for me. I I liked this set of chapters, and again, it seems like we we timed it just right. Where it ended, you know, on a on a high. We ended with chapter fifty six at this this epic moment, and you're telling me there's there's more epic or at least interesting to come. So I'm I'm excited to to keep on reading. I'm. I, I've honestly just begun to thought about this Dalinar nausea and thrill capital T thrill and I'm honestly really curious to, to learn more about that I, I don't know that that will be fully explained um, just because it's capitalized doesn't mean it's that important but it is definitely a, a point to not overlook and I'm really curious I, I think we're going to learn more about Dalinar. I'd hope so in these chapters that uh, since this part of the book is about him, at least partly. 
and so I want to see if there's more about him and that and the old magic. Uh, we'll see. Hopefully, that, that's what I'm most curious about going into the future chapters. Cool. Well, we can wrap it up here and go read further. Thanks for joining me, Elliot and Paul. Until Always. next time. Always.